those of you that don't know me, I am the Archaeological Archive Manager at the Museum of London's Archaeological Store. Um, I've been there since a volunteer in 2003 and now eventually get to manage it, apparently. Um, but what I'm talking about today is something that has been sort of a personal project of mine, I guess, over the years since uh, 2012 and has evolved into this um, new kind of way that we can digitally engage a much wider audience with the collections that in some cases we're not even aware that we have. So, uh, this is, again, a bit of a strange audience, because most of you, I'm guessing, have heard of the archive. What I usually talk to audiences is people go, oh, I didn't know there was a third site, the Museum of London, but I'm fairly confident that most people in the room have heard of uh, Morton Wheeler House, where the Museum of London's archaeological store is, and you're probably aware that we have a Guinness World Record that tells us that we're the largest archaeological archive in the world. Hurrah! I always say this and then say, it's probably because the larger archives aren't aware that we've got it and haven't argued against us, but that's something for another day. Um, the question I'm asking here, though, is does more stuff mean that we have more options for engagement? And just because we're the world's largest, does that mean that we're the best at using our entire collection or the majority of our collection? And when I really think about this, the answer is no. Regularly, for many years, I keep going back to the same old stuff I was always going back to learning collections, which the majority of museums and stores have. They're, I think I mentioned earlier, but we have these colour-coded um, displays where these objects with green around them, are safe objects that anyone can handle. The amber ones you can take a close look at, and the red ones, uh, careful look at. Um, but they're the objects that have gone past our conservation teams and have been deemed suitable for any kind of public engagement work. And it generally is the good stuff or the pretty things outside of these objects that we use for our tours and visits and object handling events. Now, I'm a really strong advocate that any artefact in any collection has a purpose and has a story, hence why do we have it in the first place? So anything really can be used for engagement. Um, and the real question is, why aren't we doing things with the rest of it? And what about the rest? What can we do? So back in 2012, I'm guessing most of you participated or at least heard of Day of Archaeology. A few nods in the room. It was a great initiative. And what we wanted to do for the Day of Archaeology when it was first set up was do something slightly different. Rather than just post the blog, see if we could have some kind of interaction with the audiences that were reading these blogs. So um, when, our, when we were still called Lark in those days, um, it was a lot cluttery. And we invited people to tweet us a number and um, then we would divide the, sec uh, the store up into different sections, uh, go to the corresponding number in our shelves. So if you picked 200, we'd go to shelf 200, find something off that shelf, open up the box at random, take the photograph of an object, tweet it back to them, and people go, whoa, that's really nice. Um, and that's basically how it worked. Um, and that was good. And we had some interesting results. First of all, it meant that we had a random re rediscovery of our own archive. Now, when you've got a massive archive like we do, um, you tend to go to the same investigations, the same sites, and those small sites that are only in a couple of boxes that may not have necessarily been published tend to get forgotten. So this offered us a completely random opportunity to find these sites with, which had amazing artefacts in that we as staff weren't aware of. It was also a really nice range of items because we separated the game into different elements of the store, so our general finds, our registered finds, our environmental finds, and also our paper records, it meant that we could expose those elements of the collection that don't always get to go on display or get used in object handling sessions. Um, and it was the good objects that came out, it was some bad objects, and there were also um, ugly and empty objects. And when I say empty objects, that's actually empty shelves. Um, because it was randomly selected, this shelf happened to be empty, but that also gave us an opportunity to say, um, we've got an empty shelf. Hurrah, we've got more expansion space. It's rare. Hooray. Um, but this is some of the stuff we're doing. This shelf was, um, is empty because of the volunteer work that's taken place there. So you can have a follow up. Uh, this particular tweet doesn't have it, but we did tweet some saying why this shelf was empty. The really important thing that every person that tweeted us had a personal item. So it suddenly became a personal experience for that player, for that person that was engaging with this um, idea. And as you can see from this response here, um, wasn't what they were expected, but uh, they really liked the artifacts they got from this. Sorry, oh, you can't see it. It's all in the corner, but it's um, some little environmental finds, some little insects. I should duck down if you can't see. 
the whole thing really works because it plays on this sense of mystery. You don't know what you're going to get. You could get something that's absolutely beautiful. You could get something that's pretty random. You could get an empty shelf. So it really does play on this sense of mystery. And our initial results were pretty good. We rediscovered 50 to 100 objects each time we played this. Um, or, or rather, we tweeted 50 to 100 objects, and we rediscovered lots in doing so. We found that we were engaged with a new audience. It wasn't always people that were interested in archaeology. It sort of expanded to people beyond archaeology and museum audiences. And most of all, it was 100% fun. There wasn't one negative response to it. And if you're looking at Twitter impressions, which I know aren't as important as Twitter engagements, but still, the number of times that these uh, tweets were potentially seen by people were pretty large and expanded as the years progressed. Um, so what we started to do was implement this on any tour of the archive. So I guarantee you that anybody that comes on a public visit to our store now, at one stop on that store, they're going to see something that we don't know or we haven't prepared. So that tour becomes a unique tour for that occasion. Um, it's taken a little bit of convincing for some colleagues and uh, volunteers in the past to do this, but um, everybody does it now, and it's a really enjoyable and uh, a highlight of most tours. It also makes your visitors part of the tour because they are selecting, albeit randomly, an object from the, the shelves. Um, okay, so how could we then expand this to try and make it even more engaging? Well, the second version of this brought the game into the museum itself. And using a couple of screens and a live Skype link, we had, um, sorry, I'll bring them all up. We had a volunteer in the store where people could see she was running into the, the shelves, extracting the objects, um, bringing her out for people to show. Um, the way that we were generating the numbers in this case, because we needed a certain time delay for this person to go and get it, uh, was that we had nine mystery objects and the visitor would select 20 of those boxes and generate a three-digit number, and then we would go to that shelf number. Um, what that gave us the opportunity to do was include an object handling event with the objects in those mystery boxes. And the guys in the bottom left down here, they are members of staff at the museum that don't usually get to engage with archaeological or any kind of collection. So uh, the guy at the back is one of the visitor hosts, and the woman at the front is a member of the finance team. So my volunteer force on this occasion, I managed to convince members of staff that don't usually get involved to become part of the, uh, the team to do this. And that had a really important consequence on the people coming down to play. Because suddenly I had other people in their departments engaging with the museum collections, which rarely, in my experience, happens. Um, so this was great. The only downside of this was that the volunteer in the store was still doing what we were doing previously and tweeting that final object. So that final tweet was in the public domain and coming up on the second screen on the right. So the final object that the visitor engaged with was visually on the screen. So it had good and had pros and cons. One of the feedback was that they would have liked to have actually spoken to the person on the screen. Um, however, in terms of some of the responses that we were getting from these tweets, um, we got some pretty good engagements here on particular artifacts. 117 uh, engagements for one object is pretty good. Uh, a few of the popular magazines liked us. Um, a few of the visitors tweeted, which is good. Sorry, I should double down for those who can't see. Um, and because I was a little bit cheeky and copied in Skype's Twitter handle, the uh, vice president of Skype actually liked it, which I thought was, hey, that's a win. Um, and, and then we got some good responses as, for, uh, as it being just a good idea. One of our volunteers, uh, Tincture of Museum, uh, blogged about it, and that had a, a new audience that started to get involved and find out what exactly was happening. Um, but best of all, in my opinion, it caught the attention of the Wimbledon Tennis Championships and their museum and archive. And they said, can we have a go? And, uh, and I was like, yeah, definitely. And um, instead of potentially broken bits of, pot of pottery or animal bone or bugs, they had Serena Williams wristbands and Andrew Murray's tennis shoes. So I was expecting a pretty good response. And they also didn't do a Twitter version, but they did a Facebook Live version. And they had 64,000 views. Um, they did it slightly differently. They did the, the mystery boxes. So what was in, you could pick box one, two, or the random one. But still, you could see the level of engagement here was was something that was really good. And I thought, well, if they've done it, I need to step up my game a little bit more. <laughs> um, so we then played Archive Lottery 3. Uh, some of you may know Lucy Crichton. Um, she used to work in, 
the archive store. And this was, uh, the way I got this past the museum was advertising it as an experiment. And I actually had a, a stand saying, uh, join our experiment, talk to the screen. And that was it. So unlike any other object handling event that we've done in the past, this time, there wasn't a person physically there, although I was, it, trying to engage people to come up to the table. Uh, this time, it was Lucy on the screen waving to the visitors saying, hey, you, you with the stripy red jumper, come over and talk to me and, and play this game, um, which, unsurprisingly, attracted loads of people because they were just curious. And then this whole object handling without actually touching the object took place via Skype, via this screen. Um, and this attracted loads of people because once one person started playing, others were curious and, and they came up and we got completely a whole range of different artifacts. We had members of staff happening to walk past, stop in and purely by coincidence knowing what the artifacts were and then starting to talk about the artifacts with the visitors. So engagement of all kinds that we weren't really expecting in the first place. Um, so when we played this, uh, we only played it for I think two days and we had uh, over 300, almost 350 visitors play in. And we asked for feedback and they, everybody was really happy to, feed, to fill in the feedback forms, which I see as a good indication that they enjoyed it in the first place. And almost all said it was really fun and really enriching, which uh, for me was really good feedback. Uh, this took place during Explore Archives Week in 20, uh, ooh, 2017. And to top this, we wanted to take it one step further. So we actually live streamed using Periscope. And this was uh, three half an hour screenings, live streams. And again, proved really successful. The fun thing about this was I, we had no idea of who we were engaging when we were actually talking. So as I was talking about the objects, um, and people, we knew if you were engaging because people were supplying us with numbers, but we weren't sure whether it was just five people watching or 5,000. Uh, but as you can see, it was 5,000 live views. And then following that, um, there was another 7,000 views uh, of repeat watches and, and further watches. So, um, so we saw that as a, a huge, huge success. But the thing that really made it successful for me was that it started to inspire other organizations. Um, so the Glasgow Women's Library, they were the first to jump on board and, um, and it was really successful for them. Um, during that, uh, Explore Archives Week, other archives like Walls Archives, Somerset Archives, North Archives, they started playing. Um, and is anyone from Cotswold Archaeology? Uh, no. Well, Cotswold Archaeology played as well. Hey! So we've had quite a range of different types of archives and organisations join in. And um, most recently, last month, we actually had the Science Museum do something similar with object lottery. So if you are thinking of playing this, engaging different audiences, and you don't necessarily need to call it archive lottery. I'm not gonna, I haven't trademarked that or registered it, so, uh, so feel free to, uh, to adapt it. But, um, but they found it really popular as well and got some amazing responses. Um, for me personally, <laughs> I got to meet the Reverend uh, Cole here. Um, last year he won the Innovation Award at the Museum and Heritage Show. Um, and I didn't think we stood a chance because we were up against um, the Science Museum with the Tim Peake landing. We had uh, Facebook Live and National Gallery and all of Van Gogh's Sunflowers collaborating together for one big event. And I thought, these are massive players. Uh, but I'm not, well, I am putting this up to big myself up, but apart from that, uh, I'm really putting this up to show you that innovation doesn't need to be all fancy with virtual reality and augmented reality or anything. It just needs to be a basic idea that works and engages people.